Hey everyone, my name is Paul. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Epic, and I want to start on this Mother's Day. First of all, happy Mother's Day, and I actually want to start by apologizing to my mom for many, many things. Uh, For one, I grew up as an only child. I I was the only kid in the house. So because of that, I was always so bored and had nobody to take my energy out on. And so one of the ways I invented fun was to just scare my mom as often as I could. So I would hide everywhere. I'd hide behind doors. I'd hide at the top of the stairs, whatever I could do. And I would wait for her to come by and I would just pop out and scream. And I scared her so bad. Every single time, I'm pretty sure that I shaved years off of her life, and I feel pretty bad about it now. I was always climbing things and jumping off things as a kid, too, so I would climb on the furniture, I'd climb on the piano, I would climb over the railing of the stairs and jump off to the, to the floor below. Um, I, I was always coming into the house bleeding, you know, for some kind of reason. I have, like, multiple head injuries where I've cracked my skull open and just blood coming out of my head. I have the scars on the back of my head to prove it. Uh, so my, mom, my mom's always just a nervous wreck. Um, the head injuries also explain a lot <laughs> now that you know. But I, I'm sorry for that too, Mom. And, and really the, the, the biggest thing is that my, my birthday is, is the day after her birthday, which means that she spent her birthday in the hospital having me. And so, uh, and then after that, after that first birthday, really, my birthday sort of just took over. You know, my birthday always kind of swallowed up her birthday, and it's not right. It's not right. I didn't have as much control over that one, but it's not right. I still feel bad about it. So I want to try to make it up to my mom today, uh, and to all moms, really. Uh, So with the time that we have, I want to give all of the moms who are here three gifts, now, the, these, these are not flowers or a vacation or a pay raise, though I wish I could give that to you and all the moms here, you deserve those things. Uh, there are three gifts that I hope can give you just what you might need today. Now, before we get into this, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk mostly to moms today, but uh, if, you're a mo- if you're not a mom, don't tune out. I don't want you to tune out. Uh, even though I am gearing a lot of stuff towards the moms, uh, what we're going to talk about is still going to be really good for, for a lot of people, really helpful for a lot of people. So you just have to apply it to your own context, but I'm just giving you a warning ahead of time. Uh, second, I know, I know that Mother's Day is tough for a lot of us. I know that Mother's Day is hard for a lot of people. So if you're here and you're one of those people, then I, I want to thank you for being brave enough to be here, even though you knew how tough it was going to be. And before we go on, I actually want to read you something that my mother-in-law, Lisa, wrote for Mother's Day. And so not only is she someone, she's a mom, and she's someone who has lost her mom, and she's also a grief counselor. So who better to hear from than her on a day like this? So she writes this, thinking of all of you who are grieving, and especially today on Mother's Day, which can be so painful for many, Sending thoughts of comfort to all of you who have experienced the devastation of losing a child. Every day is hard, but Mother's Day may be ever more painful. Please take good care of you today. To those who have lost their mom recently or long ago or or perhaps will be losing her soon. To those who never got to be a mom and wanted to be. To those who still have their mom physically present but not psychologically or emotionally present due to dementia, Alzheimer's, mental illness, addiction, incarceration, estrangement, or some other reason, today may be especially painful. To those mothers who may feel their child psychologically present but not physically present, who may be estranged from, separated from, lost custody of, who live far away or haven't heard from their child in a long time, who may be struggling with addiction, mental health issues, or other reasons. Every day may be difficult, but today may feel even worse as those around you all seem to be with their children. Thinking of you always, but especially today, please be so gentle and kind with yourself today. Do what feels comforting. Take a drive or get out in nature. Be with those who bring you comfort. If you belong to a support group, reach out today by phone to another who may also share your feelings. Let others help you. But most of all, please be kind and loving with yourself. Be patient and gentle. Allow yourself to be wherever you are today. Take good care of yourself today in some way. Let those around you know what you need. If you know what may help, we're thinking of you. 
So I'm going to say thanks to my mother-in-law, Lisa. Uh, and this is what church is about. And this is what community is about. You know, we're, we're celebrating and we're honoring each other while we're also simultaneously grieving and supporting each other. And sometimes that all happens in the same space, in the same day, at the same time. There's a passage from Romans chapter 12, verse 15 that says, hey, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. And what a, what a simple, beautiful way to love each other, to do both of those things in the same space. So again, if you're, if you're here and, and today is just a tough day, we see you and we love you. Thank you for being here. If you know someone who's having a tough time today, send them a text, send them a, send them a message, send them an email, give them a call later today, and just let them know that you love them. Let them know that you're thinking about them, okay? Um, and again, thank you for being here, and, and we love you. Okay, we love you. It's going to be a good day. So as you've probably figured out by now as we roll together on this Mother's Day, I am not, nor have I ever been, a mother. Don't know if you could tell that, but it's true. I don't think it's in the foreseeable future for me. Uh, and so for about a hundred reasons, I feel a lot of pressure today. I feel a lot of pressure. I really don't want to mess this up. Really try not to mess this up. So to get ready for today, I tried to talk to as many moms as I could. I talked to a dozen or so moms who, who I love and respect, and I asked them if they would share with me their biggest struggles and concerns as moms. And so one mom, she gave me great advice. She said, just don't compare getting your wisdom teeth out to labor pain and you'll be fine. So I am definitely not going to do that, rest assured. Nobody's got to worry about that. Uh, and so I, I, I want to thank all of those moms who, who, were, who were sharing stuff with me. And, and thanks to all of them. Uh, the three gifts that we want to give to moms today are born out of three of some of the most persistent struggles that you may have as a mom. And, and so here they are. And so we're hoping that you can be encouraged today if you're a mom and if you're feeling inferior and particularly in the age of social media, it's harder and harder not to compare ourselves to other people, right? I mean, this is something that we all struggle with, I think, for, for moms in particular. You know, if you're a mom who constantly feels the pressure to look a certain way, to be a certain way, to mom a certain way. One mom put it to me like this. She said, I, I felt like I had to be the good Christian mom, the Pinterest mom, the PTA mom, the educated mom, the eat 900 servings of fruit and veggies a day mom. And there's just a ton of pressure and expectations and just kind of this fear of judgment. So if you feel like you've got to be the perfect mom, it's so hard to avoid that feeling that you don't measure up to those expectations, whether they're coming from yourself or from somewhere else. And so if that is you, you are not alone today. And today's also for you if you're a mom and you're feeling inadequate in any type of way. Uh, moms and parents, you, you know you've got to wear a hundred different hats, right? You, you feel like you're spinning a hundred plates all at once and you're juggling all these things and you're trying to be great and you're trying to be excellent at and you're trying to be the best at being a mom, at being a spouse, doing your day job, being a good friend, managing your schedule, taking care of the house. The list goes on and on and on and on. And inevitably, you're going to feel like you're not doing one or more of those things adequately. And you're going to feel judged for that. You're going to feel less than. You're going to feel like you're not enough. And again, if you're feeling that way, you are not alone. And, and today is also for you if you're a mom and you're feeling invisible. And so maybe worst of all, on top of trying so hard to be a good mom and, and trying to be good at everything else that you have on your plate and, and to fight back those feelings of judgment and not measuring up and all the other fears and concerns that come with being a mom, including your kid coming in with, with his head bleeding, you might feel completely invisible and unseen, and unnoticed. Uh, like even the people you're doing this for, your, your kids, your spouse, your family, don't see you. Don't see how hard it is. Don't see how much work you're doing. Or just don't see you for you. And, you know, you might feel like people are just starting to see you as a means to an end. You know, you're the, you're the chauffeur, you're the chef, you're the washer of laundry, you're the calendar keeper, you're the finder of lost things around the house, but you feel like you've disappeared in the midst of all of that. Your desires, your dreams, your contribution, and maybe even yourself. And so I want to say again, hey, 
you are not alone. You are not alone. If you're feeling any of that, you are normal. You are like the rest of the moms who are here around you. Uh, you're like the rest of us. You're, you're human. You're human. So today we want to speak to, to these big three, feeling inferior, feeling inadequate, and feeling invisible. And I want, we want you to know you're not alone, and we want you to have some tools to fight back against these feelings. And so we're going to take a look at a story from Scripture that's going to help us a little bit. This is exchange between Jesus and one of his disciples, Peter. And as we're going to see in the exchange, Jesus is going to give Peter some advice that I hope is helpful for a lot of us here. And the story is from the book of John. It was written by John, who is one of the disciples. And the story takes place just after Jesus was resurrected from the grave. So he was crucified, and then he was resurrected from the grave. And this resurrected Jesus, he spends a short amount of time with some of his followers. And we're going to jump in at this point. And, and Jesus and his disciples are actually sitting around a fire, and they're cooking some fish. And Jesus at this point turns to Peter, or maybe he even pulls him aside. You know, and maybe it's, it's a, a conversation that he doesn't want everyone else to hear. Maybe this is a conversation just for Peter. And he pulls him to the side, and he, sa- and he asks him this question. He says, do you love me? So Jesus asks Peter this question, do you love me? And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been asked by someone, do you love me? It kind of really feels like a test, doesn't it? Like, it feels like a test. I, you know, people just ask that. Um, so Peter says, hey, you, you know everything. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. And Jesus responds to that with, okay, feed my sheep. Peter's probably like, huh? And then Jesus asks him, the same question for a second time. He says, hey, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Jesus, I, I love you. Like, I said it before. My answer hasn't changed in the last 30 seconds. I love you. And, and Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Peter must be thinking, something is going on here. And then Jesus says for a third time, for a third time, he asks, do you love me? And I don't know if you've ever been in this kind of situation where you start getting a little bit defensive, maybe. You know how your, your, the pitch of your voice starts to, like, just go up, you know? And Peter's probably like, okay, Jesus, okay, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. All right, he's like, something's going on here. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. So three questions And three times Jesus reminds him to take care of his sheep. So a little bit of context here. Before Jesus was crucified, while he was still with the disciples, he tells Peter, he gives Peter this prediction. He tells Peter that Peter is going to deny him three times, which basically means Peter is going to deny that he knows Jesus. And and Jesus tells him, at some point here in the future, you're going to do this, and you're going to do it three times. And Peter is like, nah, Jesus, I'd never do you like that. I would never do you like that. No, no. No, no, no. And Jesus says, hey, trust me. All right, trust me. I know things. You're going to deny me three times. Okay? And then after Jesus gets arrested, here's what happens. Like, you know, the disciples, while Jesus is alive, you know, they love being around Jesus. Jesus is super popular. You know, everyone's gathering around him to teach. You know, they think that he is going to lead them uh, to, to re- lead a rebellion against Rome, and, and they're going to take back the power, right? And they're going to be Jesus' right-hand men. You know, so they're very proud to know Jesus at that point. But when Jesus gets arrested, it is now dangerous, to know Jesus and to be associated with Jesus. And so in these, in the night after Jesus is arrested, just like he predicted, three different times, people go up to Peter and they're like, hey, aren't you that guy who was with Jesus? Like, you're part of Jesus' crew, right? And and just like Jesus predicted, Peter says, nah, man, that's, that's somebody else. That's somebody else. I don't know who you're talking about. And so he denies Jesus three times. And so now Jesus is bringing us full circle. And so he asked Peter this question, do you love me? Three times. Maybe it's just to help Peter get over his own guilt of the fact that he had denied him three times before. And so Jesus is saying, hey, do you love me? Then take care of my people. Do you love me? Yeah? Then take care of my people. Do you love me? Yeah? then take care of my people. I have this really important job for you. 
Okay, I have this really important job for you. Take care of my people. And then Jesus says something else pretty strange to Peter. This is John 20, verse 18. He says, very truly I tell you, when you're younger, you dress yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Peter must be going, hey, Jesus, this is a real weird time to just remind me I'm going to get old. But fortunately, the writer of this gospel, John, he explains this for us. And he says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. So when Jesus tells Peter, hey, someone is actually going to lead you to where you don't want to go. They're going to take you by the hands. They're going to lead you where, where you don't want to go. And they're going to stretch you out. Um, and actually, we know this now, that Peter was actually executed by crucifixion. And so this is, Jesus is actually telling him, and, and if, you don't, if you don't get lost in all the details here, he's basically telling him, hey, I have a job for you, and it's going to be really hard, okay? I have a really important job for you, but it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. And then he says to him, follow me. Follow me. And so next verse, Jesus says again, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. He's reminding Peter, you got important work to do. Take care of my people. Feed my sheep. And then here's how Peter responds. I love this. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. First of all, okay, you got to know this. I think that John, and I pointed out that John's the one who wrote this. Do you know that I really think that John was a really annoying person to be around? You know how I know this? It's because the, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John. John wrote that, okay? So first of all, anyone who's writing about themselves in the third person or talking about themselves in the third person at any point is already annoying enough, all right? But when you have someone like this who's like, I'm the one, you know, this was the one whom Jesus loved. Can you imagine this in real life? Like, uh, oh, the one who the boss loves. You talking about you? You talking about you? Do you? Can you imagine this in real life? I would unfriend this person, actually. Okay, so, but, but here we are reading his words. And so, Peter sees John, and then, I love this, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? What about him? So Jesus just got done telling Peter, hey, I have a job for you. It's going to be really important. It's going to be really hard. It, there, there's going to be stuff that's not easy here. And Peter goes, well, what about him? What about that guy? Which I love. It's just so human, right? It's just so like us, isn't it? What about him? And so Jesus tells Peter, hey, follow me. And then, and then what I love about this, Jesus answers this way, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? What is that to you? You must follow me. You must follow me. Now, essentially, what Jesus is saying here is worry about yourself. Now, I didn't come to that conclusion myself. You know, there are certain passages of Scripture that are really hard to figure out and interpret. And honestly, I don't feel qualified sometimes. I really don't. So to help us figure that out, I leaned on someone way smarter than me. Check this out. Worry about yourself. Worry about yourself. Can I help? What do you want me to do? Worry about yourself. <laughs> Worry about yourself. I'll do this one, so I'm going to do that. You try! <laughs> Worry about yourself! Go die! Go! Out of the mouth of babes, right? You drive! You drive! What can I do? You drive! I love it. I love it. <laughs> so you know what Jesus is saying here? Worry about yourself. All right? Worry about yourself. What can I do? Worry about yourself. All right? Worry about yourself. Oh, you see John over there? You see John over there? You know what? If I decide, whatever I decide to do with John, what is that to you? What is that to you? Worry about yourself. You have to follow me. All right, you have to follow me. And so if I may add to what that eloquent child said, uh, God has called you to some really important work. 
God has called you to some important work. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy, but it's worth it. So focus on what he's called you to do. Focus on what he's called you to do. Focus on what he's called you to be. Stay in your lane. Run your race. Worry about yourself. And so don't worry about the mom over here. And don't worry about the mom over there. Don't worry about the moms on Instagram. And don't worry about what the moms on Instagram think about you. Worry about yourself. When you see other people, what is that to you? What is that to you? Jesus is saying, hey, you, 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 I have something for you to do. I have work for you to do. I have something for you to be. Focus on that. No more no less. No more, no less. So if you are here today and you are feeling inferior or you are feeling inadequate or you're feeling invisible, this is a good day when you stop worrying about what this person thinks over here or what that person thinks, when you stop looking to the left or to the right or over your shoulder and you can focus on what God has for you. And when you do that, and when you focus on how God feels about you, and what God thinks about you, and what God is calling you to do, and what God is calling you to be, you discover freedom, and you discover grace, and you discover purpose, and you discover strength. So if you're feeling inferior today, especially if that's you, here is the gift that I hope you receive while we're here, that you are enough that you are enough. You are enough. No matter what you see other moms doing, no matter how perfect their lives look compared to yours on Instagram, no matter how Pinterest their house looks versus how much of a war zone your house looks, you know, no matter how you feel after your very worst day or in your very worst moment, you are enough. And you know why you are enough? Because you are loved You are loved already. You are dearly loved. Your God, your heavenly Father, is looking at you and saying, I love you. I have stuff for you to do. You're already qualified because I've I've called you to do it. And that's it. That's it. And so he's asking you to do your best. And he's not asking you to do any more or any less than that. One mom I talked to this week shared that she struggled with perfectionism and I'm sure that she's not alone there. I'm sure she's not the only mom. I'm sure she's not the only person here who struggles with perfectionism. And so here's what she wrote to me. She shared something with Brene, from Brene Brown, and, and it's this. When perfectionism is driving us, shame is always riding shotgun. Ooh, that's good. That's good. When perfectionism is driving us, shame is always riding shotgun. And then here's what this mom wrote to me. She's, you know, she included this, perfectionists are trying to avoid shame, judgment, criticism, and blame. And perfectionism is a, is a self-protection tool. And the thing is, nobody has ever managed to avoid shame, judgment, criticism, or blame by trying to be perfect. I'm going to say that again. No one has ever managed to avoid shame, judgment, criticism or blame by trying to be perfect. How many of us have done this though? But instead of giving up on the whole perfectionism thing when they experience those things, perfectionists double down and try even harder to be perfect to avoid these things in the future. And with perfectionism, here's what happens. You start viewing yourself through the harshest possible lens. You start viewing yourself through the harshest possible lens. And this is a problem because the voice that you use to speak to yourself, I really think you should analyze that. Uh, I I read before in a book that, you know, sometimes we are our worst bosses. Do you know what I mean? Like, we would never speak to someone else the way we speak to ourselves. Like, we're actually, a lot of us, and I would say moms especially, we're really good at, at being kind to other people, really good at doing this for other people, but then the voice that we use on ourselves is just brutal. It's so harsh. So what lens are you viewing yourself through? I think today, some of us, we need to view ourselves through this lens of, hey, you are loved. You are loved. Can you believe that? Can you trust that? Like, you are loved. 
And I honestly believe this, that I think that, you know, you can get away with for a while just dumping yourself out for people, dumping yourself out, dumping yourself out, dumping yourself out. But at some point, you've got to learn to love yourself too. You know, Jesus says, hey, one of the greatest commandments is to love your neighbor, what? As yourself. How are you loving yourself? You can get by for a little bit by dumping yourself out, but at some point that's going to catch up with you. Some of you just need to learn to love yourself. And for us, that's loving yourself the way God loves you. Seeing yourself the way God sees you. You know, our capacity to love other people is really going to be tied to your ability to love yourself. And over and over and over again, I see this, that, you know, the, the harshest people end up having a problem loving themselves. So can you love yourself? Can you learn to do that? Can you learn to, to believe that, that you're enough, that you're loved? And then here's the thing. Once you can embrace this, here's the really cool thing that happens. When you embrace that you're loved, when you embrace that you're enough, when you reject the lie that you're inferior, here's what's really cool. It's beautiful. You are now free to ask for help. The people who are trying to be perfect, the people who are trying to keep everything together so that no one else can judge them and no one else can criticize them, they are the ones who have the hardest time asking for help. But once you've rejected that, once you've learned to love, right, love yourself, believe that you're enough, you can ask for help. You know, when, when you don't ask for that, you know, you're already feeling less than, you're already feeling not good enough, and that shame makes us keep our problems and our struggles to ourselves. So if you're not going to ask for help, you're going to get stuck in that cycle. But if you can learn to just believe that you're enough and love yourself, here's the beautiful cycle that happens. You ask for help, and when you ask for help, it gives other moms permission to ask for help too. So you just break this cycle for other people. You don't just break it for yourself. You break it for other people because you get to let someone else know, I'm not perfect. I know that, and that's okay. We're all doing our best here. And you free other people to ask for help too. So if you are feeling inferior today, I want you to know, man, you are loved. You are enough. And if you're feeling inadequate at any point, I want you to know this, that you are doing better than you think you are, and God is doing more than you think he is. This is the second gift that I hope that you can receive today. And one of our pastors, Justin, he actually talks about this all of the time. I think this is more necessary for moms than for anybody else. Uh, and I was talking to my mom last week, and she shared something with me. Uh, when I was growing up, my mom would wake up every morning, early in the morning at 5 a.m., and drive to our church so that she could pray there. So it's pretty intense, okay? So every single day, 5 a.m., she's getting up, driving to the church so that she could pray there. Now, I've always known that about my mom. I've always known that. I remember her doing that when I was a kid. And I think that was really just part of her calling. So again, in terms of staying in your lane, worrying about yourself, that was part of my mom's calling. She felt led to pray like that. This next part, though, I did not know until she told me this last week. So she was so committed to go into the church to pray, that sometimes she would wrap me up in blankets when I was three or four, uh, and I was, you know, you know, I was a little kid, and I was, I, she would wrap me up in a blanket, and then take me to the church, and she would just like slide me under the pew, and then go and pray. And, but sometimes, sometimes, when it was cold or when it was raining, and she felt like it was going to be too tough to take me to church, she would leave me at home. And my dad had already left for work, so she would go to the church and leave me at home, three or four years old, by myself. I know. <laughs> I know. So, mind you, she's telling me this last week, last week, and she's laughing, okay? She's laughing. I'm not laughing yet, all right? She is laughing, and she's like, I was always afraid that your dad was going to come back and, and find out, but, but good thing he never did. He would be so mad. I'm like, yes. Yes, he would have been. And she was also like, oh, and I would probably go to jail too. I'm like, yes, that is a strong possibility. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, if you talk to my mom about this, though, here's what she would tell you. She felt like it was that important. She felt like it was that important for her to do. She also knew that I slept like a rock, and so she was just trusting that I would just keep on sleeping. And every day she came back, I was still sleeping like a rock. I still do. 
And I share this story with you so that, first of all, if you've ever felt bad about anything that you've done, my mom has stories, okay? My mom has stories. My mom has stories. And I also share this with you to remind you that what my mom did, driving to the church at 5 a.m. every single day to pray, that's not your calling. That's not your lane. That's not necessarily what you've got to do, right? I don't want anyone to hear that story and go, oh my gosh, I am not praying enough, right? That is what God put on my mom's heart to do, and she followed that. You know, that was her and God, all right? That is not you. In fact, I strongly encourage you, please do not go somewhere to pray and leave your kid at home, okay? I actually feel really good about saying that. Don't do that. (laughs) Worry about yourself. Worry about yourself. Stay in your lane. Worry about yourself. Um, and, and I also share this story with you to tell you this. Um, you know, she, she told me last week on the phone, she said, you know, if, if I could raise a child now, like, you know, years later, if I could raise a child now, I would do such a good job. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> wait. <laughs> and she said, I, mean, I was doing my best at the time, and that's all I knew to do. That's all I knew to do. I was doing my best, and that's all that I knew. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't know as much back then as I do now. And, but isn't that true for all of us? Like, isn't that true for all of us? Isn't that true for every single mom here? You know, that you're doing the very best that you can, and you don't know what you don't know, so you're doing the very best that you can. It's true for every single person here, right? You don't know what you don't know, you're doing the be- very best that you can. You know, my mom, she wasn't perfect, but she did the best she could with what God gave her. And you know what? Here's the cool part. God handled the rest of it. She did the best that she could, and God handled the rest of it. And this is the beauty of God and his grace, that he takes what we do, and then he does so much more with that than we could ever do ourselves. And he takes what you do, and does so much more with it. And so all we can do is our best. All we can do is our best, and then trust that God is going to do more with that than we ever could. Every single parent, you need to know that today, that you do your best, and God is going to do more with that than you ever could. Every teacher, you need to know that today. You're going to do your best, and God is going to do more with that than you ever could yourself. Every person who works with any kind of people, you need to know this. You do your best, and God will do more with that than you Because here's the thing, you can't know everything. You can't know everything. You wish you knew everything. You wish you could see in the future, but you can't. And you can't control people, but you can just do your best and then trust that God is going to do more with that than you could. So you're doing better than you think you are, and God is doing more than you think he is. I wish that you could trust that and believe that today. Now, if you're here today and you're feeling invisible, then here's the gift that I hope you can receive, that you are seen, that you are seen. One of the moms I talked to shared an awesome, awesome article with me. It's called The Invisible Mother by Nicole Johnson. And you can Google this. You'll find the article pretty easily. It'll be right at the top if you Google The the Invisible Mother by Nicole Johnson. It's so good. It's so good. In fact, it's so good that I'm just going to read straight from it because it does a way better job than I could. So she's talking about, this mom is talking about feeling invisible, and feeling like a a tool that everyone in her life just uses when when they find it convenient. And she writes this, One night, some girlfriends and I were having dinner, celebrating the return of a friend from England. She had just gotten back from a fabulous trip and was telling wonderful stories. I sat there looking around at the others, all so put together, so visible, so vibrant. It was hard not to compare and feel sorry for myself. I was feeling pretty pathetic when my friend turned to me with a beautifully wrapped package and said, I brought you this. It was a book on the great cathedrals of Europe. I wasn't exactly sure why she'd given it to me until I read her inscription, with admiration for the greatness of what you are building when no one sees. And I want to read that again. With admiration for the greatness of what you are building when no one sees. And she goes on to write, in the book, there is a legend of a rich man, of a rich man who came to visit the cathedral while it was being built. He saw a worker carving a tiny bird on the inside of a beam. He was puzzled and asked the man, why are you spending so much time carving that bird into a beam that will be covered by the roof? No one will ever see it. And the worker replied, because God sees. Because God sees. 
After reading that, I closed the book, feeling the missing piece falling into place. It was almost as if I heard God whispering to me, I see you. I see the sacrifices you make every day, even when no one around you does. No act of kindness you've done, no sequin you've sewn on, no cupcake you've baked, no last minute errand is too small for me to notice and smile over. You are building a great cathedral, but you can't see right now what it will become, but I see. And she writes this finally, when I choose to view myself as a great builder instead of an invisible mom, I keep the right perspective. I think there are some people who need to hear that today. You're not invisible. You're not unseen. You're not forgotten. You're not lost. You're building something, and God sees you building it. God has called you to this important work, and nothing in that work that you are doing goes unseen. Nothing. And I know this because I am a living monument to the work that God called my mom to do. The blood and sweat and tears that some of us saw and, and the blood and sweat and tears that she didn't let anybody see. And I know for a fact there is so much that she didn't let me see, that she didn't talk about, that she protected me from. We all have someone like this in our lives, don't we? Someone for whom we're eternally grateful because of the work that God called them to do. The blood and sweat and tears that they invested in us. These are moms. These are spiritual moms, fathers, sisters, brothers, friends, teachers, coaches. So can we do one last thing today? And I'm, I'm borrowing this tactic from Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, the Mr. Rogers. And it's something that he would ask a, a group of people like this to do. I want you to take a moment and think of someone, someone like a mother or someone who did the same thankless work that mothers do for us, someone who invested in you, someone who sacrificed for you, someone who stuck with you through your worst moments, someone who wasn't perfect because no one is, but because they focused on the work that God put in front of them, they contributed and built this person that you have become. And so I want to ask everyone here uh, and at all of our locations to, to bow your heads and close your eyes. And we're going to take 10 seconds to be silent and to just think of that person, to remember that person, and to thank God for the work that they have done in your life. So let's think about them right now. I want to say thank you, Mom. Thank you to all the moms here. Thank you to the ones who aren't with us for one reason or another. We are unbelievably and forever indebted to you and grateful for you, for your blood and your sweat and your tears, for every single small thing that you've done that you felt like no one saw, for every sacrifice that you've made for sticking with us even through our worst moments, for focusing on what God has called you to do and who God has called you to be. So on behalf of the family that we have gathered here today, I hope that you know and that you believe that you are enough, and that you're doing better than you think, and that God is doing more than you think, and that you are seen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for every single mother here. I thank you for all the mothers in our lives. I thank you for everyone here, anyone here who is struggling with feeling inferior or inadequate or unseen. God, would you remind us that you love us? God, would you remind us that you've called us to something? 
God, would you remind us of who you are leading us to be? God, would you help us to trust that you're doing more than we think you're doing? God, we thank you for all of these kinds of people in our lives. God, would you help us to be more like these people and more like you? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.